Now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. When I'm overwhelmed, it's so hard to focus on solutions instead of problems. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when faced with a challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals no matter how big or small. I am a huge proponent of therapy, especially for the people that don't think they need any. Trust me, you do. And whatever's going on in your life, you can make it easier with a good therapist. If you're thinking about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and my favorite part, entirely online. So it makes it easy to go to therapy. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash ratchet today to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash ratchet. I've learned from my online business that the best time to prepare for growth is before the opportunity arrives. ShipStation sets you up for growth by directly integrating with every shopping cart and storefront. So your products are easier to find, easier to manage, and easier to get into the hands of happy customers. Don't wait until you're drowning in orders to find the right shipping solution. Upgrade to ShipStation today. What I love about ShipStation is that handling the shipping for all my online products in one place means I have more opportunities to put myself out there online, and that means more growth for my business. Whether you're starting small or scaling up, ShipStation makes ship happen. Get the same discounted shipping rates as Fortune 500 companies, whether you're sending a stack or a truck full. Join over 130,000 companies, including mine, who have grown their e-commerce business with ShipStation. In fact, 98% of companies that use ShipStation for one year become customers for life. Ship more and grow more with ShipStation. Go to ShipStation.com today and sign up with promo code Ratchet for a free 60-day trial. Start today and get set up before the biggest shipping season of the year. That's two months free. Visit ShipStation.com. Click the microphone at the top and type in code RESPECT. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and those who don't identify as either, you are listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. I apologize in advance for the sound this episode. Sometimes when I say that, people are like, girl, we can't tell the difference. You probably will be able to tell it here. I'm in Zanzibar. I'm staying in Stone Town, which is kind of like the, the old city of Morocco, the walled city. Like if you've ever traveled anywhere and there was a souk and you stayed near the souk, kind of that, but except there's no wall. But I am staying in an old part of the city. There are very narrow streets. It is a very crowded area. It can also be very loud. When I sat down to record this podcast earlier today, and right now it's 9.13 p.m. in Zanzibar. I'm seven hours ahead of East Coast Standard Time. I'm 10 hours ahead of the West Coast. I sat down to record this morning somewhere around 8.45, and I was pulling all my things together, and they're doing construction on a building directly next to my hotel. And my hotel, by the way, is a former residence of a sultan. It's very beautiful. It's also very old. The furniture is all antiques or replicas of antiques, but it's, it's very much giving old world 1800 sultan vibes. There are no elevators. When I got here and I'm traveling with my little away suitcase, um, it's the size of a carry-on, but I had to check it because of my hair products. The woman who brought my luggage to my room, she was smaller than me. This woman was no more than a size four, black woman, young, in her 20s. She took my suitcase and put it on her head. And then she climbed two flights of very steep stairs. I don't know who these stairs were made for, but I feel like I'm on a stairmaster climbing them. And I work out every day. So like I'm in like, you know, good cardio health. But like I feel the burn going up and down these stairs. But Madame took my suitcase and it's exactly 
15 kilograms, but she put it on her head and carried it up the stairs. And I was like, girl, but she carried it because there's no elevators because it's an old building. Like it's been modernized to some degree, but mostly just painted and, and the walls and foundation resecured. Like it's very pretty, but it's also very old. I like it lots. But next door, they are renovating another building. I don't know what that building used to be. I don't know what it's going to be. But they started doing renovations at 8.53 a.m. Like somebody was over there banging with a hammer. And I was like, oh, dear. Oh, dear. There's also a school not so far from me. I haven't exactly identified where, but I can hear the murmur of children. And I can, I can record with the murmur of children. The hammer, not so much. Remember the episode I did when my friend's fire alarm, what is it called? The smoke alarm. The smoke alarm was the battery was low and you could hear it beeping throughout the episode. Y'all thought that was annoying. Try listening to a hammer throughout the episode. In addition, Zanzibar is known as a luxury beach getaway. Zanzibar is also a 99.9% Muslim country which means there are mosques everywhere, which means there are calls to prayer five times a day, including including at 3.45 a.m. So I am staying in Stonetown, which I just told you is like a very packed area. It's very tightly congested. There are lots of mosques. And so when the call to prayer happened at 3.45 a.m., I just happened to be up because of the time difference. I don't really sleep through the night, but I I woke up probably at like 3.30 and I was wide awake. And so like the call to prayer was fine. But I was like, what the? And I was like, oh, OK, they, they praying. All right. The call to prayer that comes from the mosque over the loudspeakers, multiple loudspeakers at once. That happened again somewhere between 845 and 9, 10 a.m. And I was like, OK, I just give up. I'm, I'm not recording now. I'm going to get breakfast. So I went on my rooftop and I had breakfast, which was very lovely. You know, I'm trying not to eat carbs because I'm like actively trying to shrink. So I've minimized my carbs. Like I have some, but I minimized my carbs into like, you know, stuff I really want. So there was some croissants and a muffin that came with breakfast. And so I ate all the, you know, the protein, the fruit, the coffee. I was fine, but I let the croissant sit out too long and the birds noticed. And there was like an active, I don't know what kind of bird that was, but he was actively plotting on my croissant and my muffin. And like, it was like almost like swirling. Like, I don't know, like I was like, I was prey. Or at least my muffin that was sitting on my table was. And I was like, enough is enough. So I came back downstairs. There was no more call to prayer. I could hear the school children, but they were actively hammering. I was like, okay, let me just, you know, get my day started and wander out. So I wandered out at 10 a.m. And I didn't make it back until, I don't know, after 8. I walked a whole five miles and really ain't go nowhere. That's not true. I did go to another island. I took a boat to this place called Prison Island which it was only briefly a prison. Mostly it was used for the enslavement of Africans. They would use the island, the prison on the island, essentially as a holding cell. And then also because Zanzibar was a major port and people coming in from Asia, India, the Middle East to exchange goods, they would have to stay at this island, which is 30 minutes by boat. But folks coming in from other places would be at sea for months at a time to get to Zanzibar. And you could pick up or spread all sorts of diseases at sea. So when people were coming to Zanzibar, they would have to quarantine on Prison Island for a few days to make sure that they were good, healthy, and then they could come into Zanzibar to trade. So that's where I went today. It was really, really dope. I, um, I've been challenging myself to do things that I wouldn't normally do when I travel. I identified many years ago the things that I like to do. And so I never really have a bad vacation. I like beaches. I like architecture. I like doors. I like, I like cute restaurants. I like history. And as long as you can give me some combination of those, I'm good. And so that's what I do to every place that I travel. I pinpoint before I go somewhere the things that I like to do. And if that place doesn't have them, then I just don't go. But this one for Prison Island, I went for the architecture. I wanted to know about the history of Prison Island. I wanted to see the prison, which was very worthwhile. They had in the prison, because they used to you know, keep enslaved Africans there. They had on the floor like this metal bolt that they used to attach the chains to. Like it's still there, but the room that actually still has like the metal bolt on the floor 
it's now like a lounge for a bar. So like I'm like kneeling down taking pictures of the bulk and somebody behind me is ordering a margarita with no salt. Like it's a full fledged bar, like not like a Friday's bar, but like a bar with like, you know, a, a bar and stools in front of it and like alcohol sitting on shelves on the wall, like a former jail cell or a, a dungeon for enslaving people. It's a bar. So that was really, you know, interesting. Also on the island is a tortoise. I don't know what the right word is. Sanctuary? They started out with four turtles. Now they have more than 100. The oldest turtle is like 180 something years old, which I was like, that turtle predates the Civil War. His name is Grandpa, which I was like, that, that's an app name for a turtle. Okay. That was fascinating. I fed a turtle. And like, they got a bite on them. Like the, my guy was like, oh, it doesn't really hurt. It's like a nip. And I was like, no, they have like baby sized teeth. Like, I'm not really trying to find out like what that feels like. And he was like, oh, it's fine. And I was like, no, I'm good. I had like a little like stalk of spinach because turtles apparently love spinach. But I was like feeding the turtle like the spinach and like it took like a hunk out. And like you could feel like the the grip in the pool. And I was like, oh, no, like you could cut skin. He was like, oh, no, it's just a nip. No, that turtle could break skin. I'm good. But that was my, you know, out of your comfort zone activity for the day. (sighs) What's in good black news this week? I saw the new artwork for Creed 3 as well as the trailer. I think the artwork came out yesterday. And then Michael B. Jordan, he's directing the third Creed. The first two, I think, were Ryan Coogler and then Michael B. Jordan. This is his directorial debut. The trailer looks good so far. I'm like, okay, so what you showing me so far? You didn't fuck it up. I've been watching you since you were Wallace. You should know your way around a camera and a set by now. I have faith. I have good faith in him. But his antagonist for Creed 3 is Jonathan Majors. We've talked about him a bit lately because he did that GQ men's cover and he looked fucking amazing. But the trailer looks really good. My friend sent it to me and I was like, oh, it looks so good. It looks really good. Like, I'm, I'm all in. And she was like, girl, I know, like all those muscles, all those brown fine men. And I was like, not even. I was like, I appreciate Michael B. Jordan and his, his, his beautiful muscular frame. I, I especially appreciate Jonathan Majors and his dedication to reformatting his body for the role of Creed and then again to play Kang the Conqueror in this upcoming Marvel flick. I appreciate your dedication, bruh. But I told y'all, like for years, I've watched Creed or Creed 2, when it was on Netflix at least, before I went to bed. That was like I put this on to go to sleep to because I really liked this movie. And honestly, the draw of the movie was Michael B. Jordan and... um. Oh, what is her real name? She's Bianca in the film. What is that girl's real name? And I actually like her as an actress and I cannot remember her name. It'll come to me. What is the girl's name? Tessa Thompson. Boom. But it's really the relationship with Michael B. Jordan and Tessa. Also, I just think overall the Creed movies have had a strong plot. As much as I love Michael B. Jordan's physique, I think I've said that like at least two or three times now. And the slow-mo of, of going up and down his body, especially in Creed 2. I do appreciate that. I do. But I also think it's a good story well told. And this one looks like a continuation of it. At the beginning of Creed 1, Felicia Rashad is Creed's widow. And she found out that he had a child by someone else while they were married. And she goes to what looks like a detention center And she gets that kid and raises him, Michael B. Jordan, as her son. The story for Creed 3 seems to be, based on the trailer, that the character played by Michael B. Jordan, Adonis, was in the correctional facility because of something he did with another kid. And the other kid is Jonathan Majors, who has been locked up in prison all these years and doing a prison workout, which is how he got that body. And so now he wants to be a boxer because he feels like I was the one that was a better fighter, but you were the one who got lucky and was the kid of Apollo Creed and his widow came and got you. So all this time, and he says this in the trailer, you've been living the life I was supposed to have and now I want it all. So now he's coming for Adonis. And I was like, oh yes, oh yes, this is an excellent setup. 
Ryan Coogler, who wrote the first two screenplays for Creed, also wrote this one. He's not directing it. Like I said earlier, Michael B. Jordan is. But it's the storyline seems strong. It seems better than all them Rocky movies, and they made a ton of money off of those. So I'm, I'm excited. I've watched the Rocky movies, all of them, at some point in my life. I remember Mr. T was in one. I don't know if the Jonathan Major storyline corresponds or mirrors in some way or is based on the Mr. T character. I don't remember what that was in the original Rocky film, but this one looks really good. So I'm, I'm all in. And again, not just because of the bodies. Like I really do like Creed. Also, while we're speaking of Jonathan Majors, I can't remember if I said this in a previous episode. And so I want to just address it really quick now. Jonathan Majors did the cover of GQ and he looked fucking phenomenal. And black women around the Internet went crazy because they were just like, he looks old fashioned good. Somebody described him as having like a civil rights face. And I was like, I'm not mad at that. Did I say it was GQ? Actually, it might have been Men's Health. Let me correct myself. But women were going crazy for Jonathan Major's overall appearance on this cover. And men said some hating shit. Some black women, too, were going out of their way to be like, yeah, where his girlfriend is white. And they kept posting this picture of him on the red carpet with this blonde white woman. I can't remember if I said this. Am I repeating myself? Just fast forward through this part. I don't care. I mean, maybe I'm supposed to care. Maybe there's something broken about my black womanness right now. I don't care. If he had said something that was offensive about black women, if he was dating this white woman and he tried to justify his dating, which it doesn't need to be justified. If he said something offensive about black women in like defense of why he was dating this white woman or to justify why he was dating this white woman, I would be the first in line to be like, fuck you. To my knowledge, that's never been said. To my knowledge, he hasn't addressed black women one way or another, nor has he really addressed like this white woman that he's on the red carpet with. Maybe they're together. Maybe they're not. Let's say they are. Why would I care? I can't admire a black man's attractiveness because he's with a white woman. Like my eyes still work. As much as I think that he's very beautiful, the odds of me running into him, meeting him at an event and then shooting my shot and dating him are minimal and low. Whether he's with this white woman or whether he was with another black woman, was I going to date this man? So what difference does it make like who he's dating? Whether she's white, whether she's black, whether she's whatever. Look, if Jonathan Majors gets on somebody's platform and starts talking about how black women ain't shit and starts putting white women on the pedestal, I will dedicate a whole podcast to dragging his ass, to dragging him and men who think like him. But unless that happens... I don't understand like why I'm supposed to be upset that he's dating this white woman. Like, am I that insecure as a black woman that if a man is not dating a black woman, like I can't find him attractive. I can't support his work. Cause if that's the case, we ruling out a whole lot of black men for clarity, put Kanye at the top of the list. We're going to get to him in a minute. <sighs> We're supposed to be in good black news. This doesn't sound like good black news to me. Now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. When I'm overwhelmed, it's so hard to focus on solutions instead of problems. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when faced with a challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals no matter how big or small. I am a huge proponent of therapy, especially for the people that don't think they need any. Trust me, you do. And whatever's going on in your life, you can make it easier with a good therapist. If you're thinking about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and my favorite part, entirely online. So it makes it easy to go to therapy. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Ratchet today to get 10% off your first month. That's Better, H-E-L-P dot com slash Ratchet. 
I've learned from my online business that the best time to prepare for growth is before the opportunity arrives. ShipStation sets you up for growth by directly integrating with every shopping cart and storefront. So your products are easier to find, easier to manage, and easier to get into the hands of happy customers. Don't wait until you're drowning in orders to find the right shipping solution. Upgrade to ShipStation today. What I love about ShipStation is that handling the shipping for all my online products in one place means I have more opportunities to put myself out there online, and that means more growth for my business. Whether you're starting small or scaling up, ShipStation makes ship happen. Get the same discounted shipping rates as Fortune 500 companies, whether you're sending a stack or a truck full. Join over 130,000 companies, including mine, who have grown their e-commerce business with ShipStation. In fact, 98% of companies that use ShipStation for one year become customers for life. Ship more and grow more with ShipStation. Go to ShipStation.com today and sign up with promo code Ratchet for a free 60-day trial. Start today and get set up before the biggest shipping season of the year. That's two months free. Visit ShipStation.com. Click the microphone at the top and type in code RESPECT. I saw Patti LaBelle was on tour. One of my other makeup artists, Dee Dee. Dee Dee Kelly is a makeup artist for Patti LaBelle now. Dee Dee posted this clip the other day and I was so mad and I was like, shit, I ain't really, really thought about seeing Patti LaBelle in concert. I've seen her perform live, I think three times. Dee Dee posted this clip. Patti LaBelle, she is 78 years old. Do you know this woman is still getting down on the goddamn floor? Patti LaBelle, to this day, in the year of our Lord, 2022, is still getting down on the goddamn floor and rolling around rolling around on the floor while she's singing. I watched a 78 year old woman with a beat face and a snatched, snatched wig. Patty looks amazing. She got all 78 years of herself down on the floor and rolled over twice and then got up and sang and hit her high notes. She was singing this song from LaBelle. Oh, what is the name of that song? Let me look it up real quick. See if I still have it on my title. Isn't it a shame? I won't even try to sing it to you. And it's way back. It's back when she was still in the group LaBelle. It's all about a, a relationship that fell apart. But I used to listen to this song on repeat. It was on my divorce. It was on my divorce playlist. But she sang that song and there's plenty of high notes. She rolled around on the floor twice and then got up on her knees and just started hitting all the high notes. I was like, Patty, 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 Patty. I was like, I need to come back to America and see Patty LaBelle live. She's 78. She can't roll on the floor but so much longer. I want to see Patti LaBelle when she's still rolling on the floor. Time is limited. Time is of the essence. I think she has a show in Maryland in March. I'm supposed to be in South Africa then, but I'll make my way home for Patti. What else is going on? We need to talk about Kanye West, sort of, yet again. Kanye West has been doing the press rounds. He is censored on both Twitter and Instagram for anti-Semitic remarks. He said he was going to go with DEFCON 3 on Jewish people and Instagram and Twitter halted his account. So he's not able to use his typical medium to express himself. I've said this before about Kanye. I think he's in the middle of an extremely manic episode. I think he needs help. I think he needs to take his meds. I do not think he should be doing interviews. But I also acknowledge that I firmly believe that he's not in his right mind. And if he was, he wouldn't be doing and saying the things that he's saying. That said, I think it's important to note that there are also people who are bipolar and they're just like, hey, People keep trying to excuse Kanye West and be like, oh, he has, you know, mental health issues and he's bipolar and and blah, blah, blah. And people are like, hey, I'm bipolar, too, but I don't suddenly go racist or anti-black like they can they can intermingle and intertwine. But one is not necessarily related to the other. His his anti-blackness 
is not because of his bipolarness. All bipolar people are not anti-black. And this is coming from other like black bipolar people. And they're like, don't put that shit on us. That's not who we are. That's not where we are. This anti-blackness, that's some him shit in addition to his bipolar shit. Duly noted. How do I want to address this? I guess I want to address it from the stance of the media outlets. They are giving him a platform. He went on Drink Champs again. He was on Drink Champs earlier this year. I have not watched the interview and it's since been pulled since it went up. The most popular quote that I saw from the interview was Kanye saying that um, George Floyd didn't die because of the police officer that, that kneeled on his neck. In fact, Kanye said he was like, oh, his knee was barely on his neck. And I was like, bruh, like, are, are, are you kidding me right now? To this day, I have never watched the, the George Floyd snuff video, essentially murder on video. And I have actively, purposefully, willfully, intentionally avoided watching that video. I've seen snippets, of course, because at one point it was unavoidable. But by all accounts, including medical professional testimony, George Floyd's death was a homicide. It was not due to fentanyl. Is, as Kanye West said, he said George Floyd died from fentanyl and not from the officer kneeling on his neck. That's not what a medical professional said. If you need to see testimony from a medical professional, Van Lathan posted it on his Instagram. I just, I, he's unwell. He's unwell. I genuinely believe that. How do I say this? And I, and I want to be careful with my words. Even in his unwell state, he is still responsible for the harm that he causes and the things that come out of his mouth. And, and in addition to the media sites that continue to give him a platform, knowing clearly as, as anyone with basic common sense can see that he is unwell and using him and his celebrity or infamy, his notoriety for clicks, views, advertising dollars, it's unconscionable. It's exploitative. It's harmful. It's dead ass wrong. So Drink Champs airs this interview. And I don't know all of what Kanye said, because again, I told you I didn't watch the, the interview and it's since been pulled. I had no intention of watching it anyway, but it aired on the Revolt YouTube channel and it's, it's now down. The interview went up, obviously, because people saw it. And then it came down very quickly. Noriega, who's the main host of Drink Champs, basically got his ass handed to him after the interview went up because people pointed out, one, Kanye saying crazy shit, and two, he's clearly unwell. Why are y'all exploiting this man? Why are y'all platforming him, understanding his mental state? Noriega called into not just The Breakfast Club, but also Hot 97. This is what he said on The Breakfast Club. I'm just going to read this to you and I'm reading it from Complex. He said, quote, I just want to be honest. I support freedom of speech. I support anybody not being censored, but I do not support anybody being hurt. I did not realize that the George Floyd statements on my show were so hurtful. And you got to realize it was the first five minutes of the show. When he walked in, he told my producer, he said that if he'll stop filming, he'll walk out. Should have let him walk out to Noriega, which again, Kanye just was on your show not so many months ago. You're enamored with his, his celeb power, the audience and eyeballs that it will bring to your show and that you'll do anything as evidence to, to keep him there and to keep him happy and to keep him talking. I understand that Noriega is not a journalist. I understand that because of this, he doesn't operate with the same ethics that a journalist does, but it's like he almost doesn't realize the power of his own platform. Drink Champs is a force. Drink Champs is one of the number one podcasts. It's one of the number one shows for the culture. Kanye West doesn't have a Twitter or an Instagram right now. He needs you more than you need him. You're concerned about like, oh, Kanye said if we stop taping, he'll walk out. Let his ass leave. And what? When Mark Lamont Hill was on... Huffington Post. 
one of his best interviews where would really put Mark Lamont Hill on the map is when R. Kelly walked out. One of Gail King's best interviews. Gail King has been a journalist for the same amount of time, give or take a year, that Oprah has been a journalist. Just two different platforms. Even when she became the host of the CBS Morning Show, people still thought of her as like Gail King, comma, Oprah's best friend. She didn't become capital T-H-E Gail King until after the R. Kelly interview. R. Kelly didn't walk out, but R. Kelly getting upset at Gail's line of questioning and ranting and raving and acting a whole buffoon, that's the shit that made Gail King the Gail King as opposed to Gail King, comma, Oprah's best friend. There's a value in asking the right questions and providing the right context and people getting mad and walking out. There's, there's something to that. I mean, you kind of look like an asshole for inviting somebody who has clear mental health issues on your show but, and then, you know, trying to check them logically because the shit they're saying doesn't make sense, which you knew it wasn't going to going in. The real thing that you should have done was never have Kanye on your show. But if that was your choice to do, which it was, you should at least recognize the power of your platform, Nori. Again, he needs you more than you need him. He doesn't have a platform right now. He can't tweet. He can't get on Instagram and harass all the people that he's been harassing. He can't go post screenshots of people reaching out to him, trying to help him. He can't terrorize his ex-wife or Diddy or Meat Mill. He can't do that right now. He needed your platform. You out here acting like you a podcast with 10 listeners. Nori continued. He said, I apologize to the George Floyd family. He's, he continued again. He said, I apologize to anybody that was hurt by Kanye West's comments. Complex says Nori was asked why Drink Champs even bothered with the interview at all. Nori said that he's had one-on-one -on -one scenarios in the past with Kanye and Kanye treated him well. Nori ain't trying to get sued. Nori ain't trying to get accused of being anti-Semitic. You shouldn't have a man who's in the middle of an anti-Semitic controversy on your show. You could get away with some things as a journalist on some, I was just asking questions. I just wanted to know the backstory with somebody at least who's not clearly in the throes of a mental health crisis, but you can get away with some of that as a journalist, but you don't even call yourself that. Like you're on some entertainment shit. You associating with him right now makes you look just as bad as he did. Now you're on a fucking apology tour trying to distance yourself because you put yourself in some shit that you didn't have to do. Um, George Floyd's family is suing Kanye West for 250 million with an M USD dollars and dineros. I think it's the mother of George Floyd's daughter. I'm reading this on Vulture. Give me a second. It's loading. George Floyd's family plans 250 plans. So they haven't launched the lawsuit yet, but they plan $250 million lawsuit against Kanye West. Roxy Washington, the mother of Floyd's daughter, she will file a $250 million lawsuit against Ye for harassment, misappropriation, defamation, and infliction of emotional distress. Washington is filing on behalf of her daughter, Gianna Floyd, the beneficiary of Floyd's estate. Yeah. Nori's apology and, and his, the DJ apology, they was trying not to get named in this lawsuit, which... Good for them. I don't know if they got $250 million between them. Kanye allegedly can actually afford $250 million. There's also a, a slight precedent. Where are my legal people at? Tell me if I'm, I'm onto something here. What is the guy in the Sandy Hook case? Didn't he just have to pay like some insane amount of money? Alex Jones, I'm reading this on BBC. He was ordered to pay $965 million in damages to the Sandy Hook victims, the families of eight victims and an FBI agent who responded to the attack. I'm reading this on BBC.com. It said Jones, who founded the conspiracy laden InfraWars website and talk show, argued for years that the massacre was, quote, a staged government plot to take guns from Americans and that no one died. He called the parents of victims crisis actors and argued that some of them never actually existed. <sighs> what an asshole. I think it was $965 million, I mean, for the false claims, but I think a lot of it was for emotional distress. And just for the record, Sandy Hook, 20 children and six adults were killed. 
And America still ain't do shit about gun laws. Even after the, all them little white kids was killed. I was like, fuck the rest of us. If little blonde white kids can be murdered at school and nothing is done, the rest of us are fucked. Okay, so I'm reading further on the BBC. It said that the $965 million total that Alex Jones was ordered to pay, it was the cover of emotional distress as well as slander and defamation. That's essentially what the, the mother of George Floyd's daughter, if she goes ahead with this lawsuit, since it's planned, it hasn't actually happened yet. Um, but if she goes forward, she's taking the same route that they used to get all that money from, from Alex Jones. So, yeah, Kanye might have... Uh, <laughs> You've, you've seen that video of the white guy doing a graph about the correlation between fucking around and finding out? That seems like what Kanye's about to get in the middle of. Speaking of his finances and perhaps his friendships, I think we might have to mention the friendships first to, um, to explain the financial situation. Kanye West has been palling around with, I'm trying to figure out how to describe her. I guess she's a, a conservative. Candace Owens. She is a pox on black humanity. She and Kanye have forged this weird friendship, partnership, business relationship. I don't know what it is, but when he did the shirts with, with white lives matter, one of the people he had posed up, she might've walked in the fashion show, but there was a picture of them all over social media posed up together, showing off the, the white lives matter on the back of their, their sweatshirts, t-shirts, clothing, whatever. Kanye West has been banned, as I mentioned earlier, from Twitter and Instagram. And so his response to this is to buy a conservative social media platform called Parler. If this sounds very familiar, it's about the same thing Trump did when he got banned from social media. He went and bought like his own social media platform so he could speak freely on there. So Kanye West is planning to buy Parler. I have no idea what the, the actual amount is. I've looked it up in several places. I didn't see it. If you know the number, please send it to me. I think it's worth noting that the CEO of Parliament Technologies, which owns Parler, is Candace Owens' husband. So I saw something earlier. I think it was on Van because Van has been going hard on the Kanye thing for obvious reasons. Don't quote me on that. I think it was Van. But it basically it was like, is this the finesse of all finesses? Candace Owens snuggles up to Kanye West. They become anti-black allies. And then she convinces him to buy her husband's company. Apparently, Parler is murdered in debt. But you convince Kanye West to go ahead and buy it. So you and your husband cash out to the tune of multiple millions and leave Kanye West holding the bag. Is that the plan? It's a good plan. I, th I think um, Candace Owens, I called her a pox upon black humanity, but I didn't call her stupid. What they say about wives? A good wife is more precious than rubies and gold. Is that what they say? Is that what the Bible says about a wife? She might be a shit person. She also might be a great wife and she can pull this shit off. I'm just saying. Even if you're, you know, exploiting someone who's in a mental health crisis. I mean, let not capitalism overwhelm my ethics when I speak about this. I don't know what else to say about this. I guess I, I guess I, I I guess the same thing that I said last week. I hope Kanye West gets help. The Surreal Life brought you some of the craziest celeb moments in TV history. Now, on Monday, October 24th at 9, 8 central, the first celeb reality social experiment is back on VH1. Buckle up, because this season is surrealer than ever, as eight unfiltered celebrities from all different walks of fame are forced to live under one roof. Away from the spotlight of Hollywood, these big personalities will step out of their comfort zones and reveal their true selves. Dennis Rodman, August Alsina, Tamar Braxton, Frankie Muniz, Manny MUA, Kem Coles, CJ Perry, and Stormy Daniels will connect and collide in unexpected ways, leaving reality fans on the edge of their seat. Trust me, things are about to get surreally wild. Don't miss The Surreal Life. New season premieres Monday, October 24th at 9, 8 central on VH1. I thought we could end this episode talking about Kanye West, but apparently we cannot. Apparently we cannot. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot. We need to talk about Isaiah Washington. Remember him? Isaiah Washington was in Love Jones. And he delivered the best lines of the movie. I don't know if, if uh, American Netflix has 
Love Jones. Ghana Netflix does. I've been watching Love Jones to fall asleep, at least when I was in Ghana. Don't tell me shit about falling in love. Somebody tell me how to stay in it. Sir, sir, talk to the people. Talk to the people. Let me see your wallet. Say bad motherfucker. I don't need to quote the whole film. But Isaiah Washington, I met him, met him as an actor, quote unquote met. I met him as an actor when he was in Love Jones. He went on to do other roles, the most recognizable of which was Grey's Anatomy, which he was kicked off of for apparently dropping an F-bomb on one of his co-stars who was gay. But not only did he get kicked off of Grey's Anatomy, he struggled as an actor for years after that. The only time he's really popped back up on my radar for real, for real, is he was in the first season of P-Valley and he played the mayor. And he was electric. He was wonderful on screen. No one's ever accused him of being a bad actor. In fact, in fact, Sterling K. Brown probably wouldn't have the same career if Isaiah Washington hadn't fucked up. They have the same phenotype and a very similar acting style. Half of Sterling K. Brown's roles would have gone to Isaiah Washington had Isaiah Washington not been the fuck up in his personal life that he is. Sterling K. Brown is wonderful. He is amazing. He is a very, very talented actor. So is Isaiah Washington. Sterling K. Brown has the benefit of being likable and knowing when to shut the fuck up. Isaiah Washington does not have that benefit. Even, even, even years later, before we even had a word for for canceling people, before we even called it being canceled, Isaiah Washington was effectively canceled in Hollywood. He worked his way back. He started getting roles. He started getting roles and he started doing interviews. Isaiah Washington is 59 years old. Isaiah Washington still ain't learned shit from when he got canceled after Grey's Anatomy because his ass, Isaiah Washington did an interview on Vlad TV. I'm reading this on Yahoo News, which he was only granted because he's relevant again. For whatever reason, Aaliyah's name comes up. I'm sure I watched Romeo Must Die when it came out. I don't remember Isaiah Washington being in it. But again, it came out in 2000. It was 22 years ago. I don't remember it. Okay. I guess Vlad asked him about starring with Aaliyah on Romeo Must Die, which is a fair question. Washington, again, 59 years old. He says he had a crush on the then 21-year-old Aaliyah. He described her as, quote, mysterious and described her as, quote, mature. She's 21. If he's 59 now, subtract 22, 37? What fucking 21-year-old is mature to a 37-year-old? What are you talking about? You had a crush at 37 on a 21-year-old? What the fuck is wrong with you? Doesn't in there. When asked about the narrative of Aaliyah being a victim of R. Kelly's, Isaiah Washington says he believes the former couple's relationship. I object to calling R. Kelly and Aaliyah a couple. She was 15. He was in his 30s. She was not even old enough to consent. He's a grown ass man. Isaiah Washington said it was a business move that the late songstress was very much in charge of. Again, reading this on Yahoo, he says, quote, she was very in control of her being, but she was a businesswoman too, super smart. I think she was in control of that situation even at her age. She was 15 going on 30, so she was in control of that whole situation. Quote, I don't judge her, but she was very smart and very mature and very in control of her situation. I don't believe one minute that Aaliyah was made to do anything that Aaliyah didn't want to do. She was 15, nigga. Yo, if if you know Isaiah Washington, don't don't leave him around your kids. It's definitely not your teenage daughters. Say you're a predator without saying you're a predator. And I'm saying predatory rape. Say you're okay with statutory rape. Without saying you're okay with statutory rape. What the fuck? She was 15. You're saying a 15-year-old understood her interactions with a 30-something-year-old man? 
If you talk to me about a 15 year old dealing with a 16 year old, a 15 year old dealing with a 17 year old, I'll even press it. And this is as far as I go. A 15 year old dealing with an 18 year old because that three year age difference, the difference between being a sophomore in high school and a senior in high school about to graduate is an entirely different world. I can tell you that from somebody who's been 18 and somebody who's been 15. I can tell you about the mind of a 37 year old person because I've been 37. There is nothing, nothing, nothing at 30 some odd years old that a 15 year old can do for me. There was nothing at 21 years old that a 15 year old could do for me. To be quite honest, I turned 21 before my boyfriend at the time, he was 20. It was difficult for that nigga to do anything for me because he couldn't even get in a goddamn club or buy me a drink. How are we having this conversation? You talk about a 15 year old was mature enough and had a businesswoman mindset to deal with a 30 year old man. What? She's 15. Does she even have a learner's permit? She definitely ain't got a driver's license. What, what can you offer? Vlad TV ran an interview and, and then posted an Instagram comment. It said, for the record, I disagree with Isaiah on this. That's why I brought up Aaliyah's age at the time. I don't believe Isaiah Washington is, is in the middle of a mental health crisis. So I completely understand why Vlad TV interviewed him. I completely understand why Vlad TV ran the interview. As disgusting as his comments were, and I'm glad that they distanced themselves from it. But I'm also glad that everyone gets to see what a predatory predator who preys looks like. He's a nice looking man. He's, he's well spoken. He's talented. He's also, again, a predatory predator who preys because this is some nasty, gross, disgusting shit. Trying to say that a 15-year-old knew what she was doing with a 30-year-old man. Get the fuck out of here. I see 21-year-olds that are very attractive, that are well-built, that are nice-looking. And I think, wow, what a cute kid. What a cutie. I'm done. I'm done. Because I'll just be stuck in this loop of, of what the fuck for like the next five minutes. And, and it's, I got to edit this shit. And I got to go to bed. Because I got a spa appointment in the morning. I'm supposed to get like wrapped in seaweed and banana leaves or some shit. I don't know. <sighs> that's not everything. But that's what it is. We'll be back on Friday. Hopefully I'll be more calm. I'll be on the other side of Zanzibar. I'll have some time at the beach. I'll bring it down to a 10. All right. Talk on Friday? Okay. Bye.